Hello, friends. Greg Kokel here, Stand to Reason. And uh, I always appreciate you being part of the show and even calling in. If you'd like to do that, my number is 855-243-9975. That's 855-243-9975. If you're outside of the U.S. and would like to call in, the number is 562. Do the international area code, which I think is one for, is one our number? I think we're number one, right? Yeah. And then 562 562- Four two four eight two two nine, five six two four two four eight two two nine, and we get. I once I got, I think I got calls from four different continents on one show, one two hour segment. That was pretty cool. Uh, so we love to hear from you, no matter where you're at. Keep in mind that the show airs, I should say, it is recorded on Tuesday afternoons from four until six p.m. Los Angeles time. So those are the times to call in, and uh, you can get in the queue right at the head of the show. I usually have some commentary, and uh, then we'll pick you up. If you call, like, late in the show, a lot of times I have no callers waiting, and we, you get right to the head of the line, which didn't exist in those cases. So please give us a call and be glad to chat with you about whatever's on your mind in the area of ethics and values and religion. And, of course, my role is to is to answer your issue, whatever it happens to be, or challenge, um, in a way that is consistent with the Christian view of reality. And I think that's an accurate view of the way the world is, and I work hard to try to defend that. That's my project. Okay. Um, I have a question that came in from someone, though, that is worth a little discussion at this moment, because it's, it, it is an area that is confusing to some people. And um, the question has to do with a verse, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. And the question is, what does the Bible mean when it says Christians should work out their salvation? And that's from that passage. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Ooh, that's kind of scary. In fact, uh, this is one of those things that make people wonder about salvation by grace. Am I saved entirely by grace? Then why should I be working out my salvation in fear and trembling, for goodness sake? And let me just read the larger context of this passage. Notice uh, it starts in chapter 2. and it talks there about Jesus, who existed as the, in the form of God. He was God, but he did not regard equality with God um, a thing to be grasped on. But he emptied himself. He set aside his privileges. He became a man, and he served us, and then died on our behalf. And having explained that, um, then Paul goes on to say, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Now he's speaking here to the Philippians. Okay, then he adds this verse, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But he also adds this, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Next line, do all things without grumbling and disputing, so that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So here we have this expression that is, uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, that um, is is in a section talking about manifesting goodness in your life, being like Jesus, humbling yourself like Jesus did, being a servant like he was, serving other people, um, um, doing all things, I'm looking at the text here, without grumbling and disputing, etc., to demonstrate that you are prove yourselves, is the word he uses, um, to to be blameless. But he has that other phrase in there, and the phrase is, for it is God 
who is at work within you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is a passage that takes two apparently irreconcilable notions. Our independent efforts based on the things we choose to do, and God's purposes based on what God purposes to accomplish. And it hinges them at the hip, and it leaves them there with no apology and no more thorough description. There is a mystery here. And the mystery is that we have a role in living our lives before God, and that's why we are exhorted to do good and not evil. I mean, to put it down in its basic components, all right, um, to do good uh, and not evil. But at the same time, there is this other element, and that is God that is working. And what is he doing? He's working both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In fact, it says specifically, he is at work in you. So God is doing something that affects our desire and our efforts to accomplish the goal that Paul said we should be accomplishing, working out our salvation. Now, uh, I don't think he certainly isn't saying working for our salvation, because every single epistle he writes makes it clear that this is something that God is that, that that salvation that God is accomplishing in our life that He has given us as a gift of His grace in virtue in response to the faith that we show in Him, we put our trust in Him. Bang! Something happens, a new birth, and we're new creatures. And new creatures are still creatures of this world, beset by the flesh. Now in a struggle, flesh versus spirit. We read about that in Galatians chapter five. But the struggle is going to be one that we will ultimately win. In fact, at the beginning of the, this book, Paul writes, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is working to accomplish an end. So my salvation is not dependent on what I do, but on what God has already done. One of the most powerful passages, I think, that captures this so beautifully is in the book of Titus. And there's two things going on here, what God has done to rescue us and the result in our lives as a result of that rescue. And I know I'm jumping from Philippians over to Titus, but part of what I'm showing is this dichotomy is always in play. God does something on our behalf, and we do something in response. But it is the first thing that is first, and the second thing that is second. Paul puts them in reverse order here. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for it is that God, God is at work with you. It work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, because God is already working in our will, in, in our efforts, then we can participate to accomplish those things that brings us to full salvation, not justification, but ultimately sanctification. And here's the way he puts the same idea in opposite order in Titus chapter 3. When the, kind, the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. It's a different standard, Paul's saying. By the washing of regenerating, regeneration and renewing, by the Holy Spirit. That's the new birth that happens when we put our faith in Christ. He continues, 
this Holy Spirit, he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He saved us. So that being justified by his grace, makes the same point a third time, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then he says, verse 8, this is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things I want you to speak confidently. Did you get that, folks? Paul is saying, did you understand that? It's God who is at work within you to will and to work for his good pleasure. Therefore, Titus again, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men, or put in the words he used in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Be serious about it. This matters. This is a big deal, okay? Um, there are many, many places in the Scriptures where we see this kind of tension in place. If you stand, and God is able to make you stand, all right? Stand you will the writer says. So there is this mystery going on, and the mystery is the, the, the working of the Holy Spirit in us to bring us to Christ, accomplishing the new birth when we put our trust in Him, transforming us into a new creature, not based on works done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, back to Titus again, God both willing and working for his good pleasure so that we can be careful to engage in good deeds, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. We are purchased and done by God to accomplish another end that God is also helping us with. Walk by the Spirit, Galatians 5, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. There's a battle going on. The flesh against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, Paul says, so you cannot do what you want. You walk by the Spirit. You trust in Him. You seek to obey Him, and as you seek to obey Him, He's actually helping you will to do that, then He is going to help you to accomplish that which you will along with Him. It's a partnership. And, he's, and Paul is meaning to give us confidence in God's working, but at the same time to challenge us to pay attention, don't take this lightly, work it out. Day by day, day by day, work it out, make it happen. And so it is a mis there is a mysterious aspect of, here, of this here, um, a, a uh, concursive operation. It's in interesting to me, that phrase, concursive operation, is one that is used to describe the relationship of the work of the Holy Spirit to the writers of Scripture. We can tell the difference between a Pauline epistle and a Joannine epistle and a Petrine epistle, because Paul and John and Peter have different styles, but it's the whole, same Holy Spirit working through them to bring out the very Word of God, exactly word for word what God wanted them to write. Well, who's writing it? Is Paul writing it, or is God writing it? Is Peter writing it, or God writing it? Is John writing it, or God writing it? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> they both are. There is this communion that is ineffable, hard to explain, hard to even understand. This operation that is concursive, the two are working together in some incredible way to produce the Word of God that bears the personality of the writer, but also are the very words of God himself. And in a similar fashion, I'm not saying that Christians write Scripture, but I'm saying there's a similar, it seems to me, concursive operation in our sanctification where we are working and God is working with us, and there's a teamwork going on there. We are expending effort, that's what we're told, to pursue godliness, to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, is the way Paul puts it. There's effort that's involved. It's not just a free ride. It's not all of God and none of me. I know there are theologies that emphasize that. I just think it's mistaken. 
because it wouldn't make sense if it were all of God and none of me for the Scriptures to continually say what we need to be doing in the process. So after Paul says, for example, back to our Philippians passage, it's at, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. So he gives a command what we are supposed to do, even though he's just said that God is going to help us and work both on our wills and our efforts to accomplish that task. Now, I'm encouraged by that, because it makes me feel like a player. Because I am a player. And But it's not like all self-aggrandizement. It's a, I'm a player in the sense that I'm a partner, and God and I are working together, and He is the one ultimately responsible for all the good things. I'm, I'm responsible for the bad things, because I bring something along with me as a player, and that's my flesh. And that's why there's this battle that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. Don't give in to that. Walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh battles against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. It's a warfare. So we have a compatriot in the battle, God and the person of the Holy Spirit helping us. We pray for help. We try to apply the truth. We are actively involved. But we are rescued. We are rescued ultimately by one thing and one thing only, and that is the magnificent and powerful grace of God. That's what saved it. He saved us by the washing, regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. Saved by His grace. Good news, huh? Okay, let's take a break, and calls coming up after this. I, I love that riff. I don't know why, but I think it's great. Uh, Greg Kokel here, Stand a Reason. Let's go to our uh, callers and another Michigami. Laura, where in Michigan are you from? Hi, Mr. Kokel. Hi there. You're from Hi. Michigan. Where in Michigan are you from? Um, I am from the Sum, if you know what that means. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. That's uh, of... Traverse City. Oh, no, no. That's, uh, that's the upper, Wait, uh, Tra- upper left. Wait. Yeah, um, the Sum is the, you know how it's shaped like a mitten? Yeah, no, um, of course. The, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Isn't isn't that's Traverse Bay? You know that crotch between the thumb and the finger, right? Isn't that Traverse City right there? Where the no, thumb? Traverse City's up um, up on the left in the mitten. In the mitten. Okay. Yep, up north. Oh, I got like, you. All right, all right. My mistake. I went to Michigan <laughs> State. Right. I went to Michigan State University. Oh, did you? Yeah, MSU in 1970 to 72. But maybe the shape of the state changed since then, so you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. with all the fresh water eroding us. Who knows? Happen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the polar ice caps coming down. <laughs> all right. So, Laura in Michigan, uh, w- what town? Uh, North Branch is where I grew up. North um, Branch, okay. Yep, and it's funny because it's not north. So, uh-huh. everyone, it's uh, not West Branch, which is actually north. Okay, so that's um, not Petoskey. The Petoskey's. Mm-mm. It is or not? Further north, yeah. That's further north, that, okay. That's where they that make the... That would be this. east of Traverse City. I got you. That would make, that's where they make the stones. Okay, got you, Petoskey mm-hmm. Stone. All right, got it. What's on your mind? <laughs> um, I have been struggling with this for a while. Um, I have a lot of uh, non-Christian friends. Uh-huh. Um, it feels like we, we are sinning. Um, and I have... I've changed a lot in my life, especially over the last um, several years. Did you say Um, teach? You teach a lot? Is that what you said? I changed. I changed a lot. Oh, you changed a a lot. Okay. Yeah. And so over the last several years, I've made a lot of changes in my life. And it's kind of funny, the last Michigander that you talked to, um, talking about, like, celibacy and all that. And I actually, you know, changed that about me and became celibate. And so I'm having a hard time um, with you know, my friends that, you know, don't live a Christian, uh, you know, a Christian life uh-huh. and actually kind of scoff at mine a little. Um, they, like, wonder why I live the way I do. Mm-hmm. But, it's, I mean, my main question is, because um, I'm sure you have other colors, sorry, uh, is it's so hard for me to be happy for them 
when they have life events. Right. You know, like, oh, I'm moving in with my boyfriend, or, you know, they talk about their sex life, right. and they, like, want me to be excited for them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or, hey, we're pregnant, and, you know, they're they're not married, and, um, mm-hmm. like, it's hard for me to be excited for that. Um, but I want to, you know, I we're supposed to, you know, love our neighbor. We're supposed to, mm-hmm. you know sacrifice ourselves, you know, for our brother. And, and, and I just, I, I just have, I'm having such a hard time and I'm trying to not be selfish. I'm trying to not be, you know, condemning. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just, I've been really struggling with it and, and I need your advice. Well, (laughs) I'm glad you, I'm glad you called, um, because, um, I struggle very in in a similar way with the things that you just described okay um by the way just for clarification sake you said there have been changes in your life that have do you mean i i suspect that you have now as a single person adopted a celibate lifestyle sexually when you were not celibate before and this surprises your friends is that right correct okay yeah they they actually get up like some of them get really upset about it Okay, let me let me. I'll ask you about that in just a moment. But you know, there is a verse. I I, I can't read. Maybe Amy can find it for me. But there's a verse that's. It's in First Peter, maybe two or three. First Peter two. <laughs> Amy, we we are we have the uh, Vulcan mind meld here. So I didn't even mention <laughs> what I was after, and she gives me the reference, and I think it is First Peter chapter one. Uh, let's just see here. Uh, really not. The verse I'm looking for is when it says, and you used to be living this way and cavorting with all these people doing all these things, and now you don't, and they're wondering, what's up with you? Because mm-hmm. you're not doing that. Did you find it yet, Amy? Oh, she did. Is it First Peter? She, she's paging through. <laughs> she's nodding, but she doesn't have it yet. <laughs> I know, because she didn't grab the mic yet. She's confident of her source. <laughs> Go. It's in chapter three. Oh, chapter three. Okay, you're three pages. Oh, sorry, away. chapter four. Oh, chapter four. Why oh, you're such a loser, Amy? You're three <laughs> chapters off. I can't believe it. Okay, where three, are we at? Three and four. Verses three and four. Okay, it says for the time already passed. This Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four, verse three. The time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. Sound familiar? Yeah. (laughs) And then it says, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So, um... I hope, first of all, this is an encouragement. You are on the right track, and the fact that your friends malign you is just evidence that you're on the right track. Now, hopefully that will make you feel a little bit better about being maligned. Uh, maybe not. But at least, you, you know, it, to me it's an encouragement. I was, there's a verse in the prior chapter I read a lot, and uh, or maybe it's chapter 2. At the end of chapter 2, it says that... Um, what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated and you endure it with patience, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So there's a contrast here, okay? And the contrast is um, these people are, you're not trafficking with them anymore in the kinds of behavior that you used to do, but don't, and they still do. And mm-hmm. what what God says here is that they are going to have to give an account to God. But for you who suffer for doing what is good, you find favor with God. Now, I read these verses, especially this one in chapter 2, in fact, that's where my marker, I've got a marker permanently at this spot, because I want to be reminded that God finds favor with me when I do what's right, even if other people don't think so. 
and they malign me in some fashion. Okay? And this happens to all Christians in some measure. And I need to keep reminding myself, it's okay, Greg, you find favor with God in this issue where you're doing the right thing, when you're suffering maybe for doing the right thing. And uh, in fact, it says that a little further down. While being reviled, Jesus didn't revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. There's the model for us. So the first thing I'll say is hold your ground um, with the understanding that God approves of you if your friends don't. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first piece of the puzzle. Now, that doesn't mean your emotions aren't going to be tossed to and fro when you have to deal with these circumstances and when they're nasty to you. And your question really was, okay, how do I love these people properly? And how do I even, you know, interrelate, be happy for them, is the way you used it, when they're doing immoral things that are having consequences like getting pregnant? Okay. So mm-hmm. um, I I think I don't know. this is a struggle. Remember, I said I sometimes struggle with this too, and I mentioned to somebody today. I just think I'm getting crankier and crankier. <laughs> yes, I did the first show today that was that was went out earlier in the week. Uh, you know, I'm doing this thing about uh, about the silly argument in favor of abortion, and it just annoys the heck out of me when these cocky people say foolish things that have just really weighty moral consequences, and they don't care. They just got this chip on their shoulder. It's all about them. That bugs me. I don't like getting bugged at people, but I find myself getting bugged more and more because it's such a Mm -hmm. screwy world. So I have to fight that. All right? I have to, I just have to be aware of it. I got to push back against that tendency. All right. And um, when I'm dealing with them, I need to go over, I have to consciously work to treat them with grace. Now, there is a question of how do I respond when they tell me about the great sex they just had, or the person they're living with, or the one night stand or whatever. Well, I do, don't respond to that. Yeah. I'm not going to say, hey, cool, nice job, you know. You know, something like that, because it's not. I, 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 I'm not going to respond to it. Now, when I don't respond, they might notice and say, blah, blah, blah. Well, mm-hmm. you're a goody two-shoes. I say, I'm saying I'm not trying to be a goody two-shoes. I, I just, I'm not, this doesn't resonate with me. It doesn't impress me. Sorry, what can I say? Just like if I told you about a bunch of gay guys I beat up, you wouldn't go, hey, cool. Right. Okay, so, uh, which I I wouldn't do anyway, but I'm just using an alternate example. But you're not going to be able, I think, to consistently convince them that you're swell, even if you're a great gal in their mind, because you don't celebrate with them. That takes us back to that passage. So you're just going to have to learn to live with that, okay? And uh, if all Christians experience this, uh, by the way, we just gave a couple readings in First Peter. First Peter is, uh, I encourage you to spend some time in First Peter, especially if yeah. what you're facing, because this whole book is dealing with suffering Christians. And at the end, chapter 5, Paul gives, uh, rather, Peter gives a warning about the devil who's dangerous, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Well, we don't run into the devil. I didn't see him yesterday. I haven't seen him ever. That doesn't mean he's not working in a way to influence Christians, and one way he does it is by people we care about. And he yeah. works through them, right? And here's what the the exhortation that Peter gives. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. All right? So it's just another way of saying, Laura, you're not alone. There are other Christians who are in the same boat as you are. It's okay. We're in this together. 
We're going to hold out. We're going to do what's right. We're going to try to please God rather than men when push comes to shove. It's not always a choice between the two, but when there is a choice, we're going to try to please God. We're going to try not to be uppity, our nose in the air, I'm too good for that, or whatever. I'll tell you, that's the way I feel in my heart sometimes. I'm condescending yeah. to people who are living this way, but I've got to instruct my own attitude. I have to apologize to God. I say, I'm sorry, God, I'm thinking that. I'm just sorry. Help me out. And then I, I commit myself to treating them with grace. But it doesn't mean I have to laugh at their nasty jokes. It doesn't mean that I have to celebrate their behavior that's immoral. Okay? It, it, you mm -hmm. can just, you know, poker face it if you have to. And if they press you on it, and they say, well, why aren't you going to rejoice with me? And I say, well, let's just, I, I can't rejoice in that because that's not my view. That's not right. my connection. I, you, don't, you don't want to come across holier than thou, but you also don't want to be pushed around by them. Okay, now there's one other thing you mentioned I want to speak directly through, and that's pregnancy. Mm -hmm. This is hard because a pregnancy by uh, a couple who is not married reflects immoral behavior, all right? But the pregnancy isn't immoral. It's the behavior that led to the pregnancy that was immoral, even when it wasn't leading to a pregnancy. Right. So when a child is conceived and there's a pregnancy, I think it's appropriate to celebrate the pregnancy. Because that's a miracle. Yeah, it's a kind of a miracle, right? It's a natural process, but I know what you mean. Using the word in a more general sense, it's a wonder. It's a wonder. A new child has come into the world, and that is a wonder that can be rejoiced in. And um, boy, I'm telling you, you're going to really look like a sourpuss if you turn <laughs> your nose up to that. Now, I know. <laughs> you know. Um, now, my wife worked at a. She was a single mom before we got married. Her son was 16 when we got married, and she worked at a CPC, a crisis pregnancy center. That's where we met. And her opinion, and I'm not sure if she's changed this or not. Maybe I'll ask her tonight. Her opinion was that when that you you provide for a pregnant woman because there's needs involved there, but um, she wouldn't go to a, a celebration like a like a um, what do you call it um, a, a shower, shower, a baby shower, or something like that. I think that would probably seem really extreme now. Maybe 20 or 30, or 30 years ago, that wouldn't have seemed so extreme, but it's, it would seem very cold-hearted. The reason her mind was, well, you, you, you don't want to celebrate the event, but you want to care for the child. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, she might think differently about it now, because there's so much uh, children born out of wedlock. It's, they're not... Um, illegitimate children. It's the circumstance that's not legitimate, not the child, you know. Right. But nevertheless, the child is still the child, a wonder, and a valuable human being made the image of God. We care for that, and we celebrate and do the best we can to give a good home for that child. And this usually means families involved and stuff like that, picking up the slack for a single mom. So I do think pregnancy is a little different and um, you can celebrate in your heart the, the fact of a newborn child without, it, it, that. in my view, that is not celebrating the relationship that produced the child. Yeah. And, and I guess I wouldn't be inclined to tell you not to go to a baby shower if you were invited under those circumstances. What we want to do is we want to try to provide the best atmosphere for the growth and development of that child physically and emotionally, that we can, and this child already has circumstantial strikes against him or her, mm -hmm. okay, being, being raised in a family without a parent. Uh, and so um, you want to do the best you can. So I, I don't know, I'm, I'm hap I'd be interested in some feedback from you on what you think of what I've offered here so far. I think this is a tough situation. I am sympathetic to your your ambivalence about these things, to some degree we have to discipline ourselves in our response so that we behave in a loving way, even though inside we're going, uh, but we also don't want to play, behave in a way that 
that seems like we're celebrating or a f- affirming a behavior itself that isn't that isn't good. And this is why uh, I, we, we recommend not going to gay weddings, for example. Right. That's a and, celebration, and that's, support. And that's definitely something that my, you know, my friends would be just appalled by, that I wouldn't go, but they would know that I wouldn't, you know. And, and I don't try to hide um, my beliefs. I don't, I don't stray away from talking about it. And, and I've really described to people, like, I've made this change. Yeah. Um, I've made a lot of changes, but the celibacy and... Uh, specifically has really brought me a lot of peace. Um, and I like clearly <laughs> that, that says that I'm heading in the right direction. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, I, I share that with people and I share my story because I go, Hey, like you can feel this way too. You know, you, you talked about it with the other Michigander, um, you know, how you, you live a good life that way Mm -hmm. like you actually you know you honor your father and mother and it will bring you Mm -hmm. you know good and so i i um i appreciate you know uh especially like i I, i'll i need to get into first peter i um i actually have been reading romans and Mm -hmm. and i know i know amy loves romans she does um (laughs) she's smiling at you right now (laughs) um oh i know i listen to hashtag str and so should everyone else good um so I, I just, I just have been struggling because, um, there's just a lot of ridicule. I get, it's just really crazy how the world is so sensitive. I'm I doing know. Air quotes. I, I know. I, 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 well, this is where I, I was at a session once where Bill Craig was, it was kind of a private session where he was talking about uh, how he debates and everything. And somebody asked him, William Lane Craig, the philosopher, and he said, how do you deal with all these people that are so mean and nasty to you? And he said, I rejoice. You rejoice? Yeah, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Rejoice. Your reward in heaven is great, you know? So you might check that out, too. It's right there, the right immediately after the Beatitudes. But um Maybe a question that you could ask some of these people who are giving you a hard time is, 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 is what do you call a Christian who does not live by his or her convictions? There's a word they use all the time. A hypocrite. A hypocrite. So would you, I'm carrying on what I would say to them, would you prefer I be a hypocrite or live consistently with my convictions? That's a fair question. And how, yeah. and how is living by my convictions, which means I'm not sleeping around, or, or I don't know if the thing about a, a, a same-sex wedding came up or not, but if it did, not going to that, how is it me living by my conditions, convictions is a problem for you? We have different yeah. convictions, right? Do you, do you believe it's a, Here's another question. Do you believe it's appropriate to be authentic? Oh, yeah. I know what authenticity means. It means you do you. That's authenticity on their view. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why shouldn't I be authentic and live according to my convictions? So these are questions. But what we're doing is we're trading on their language and we're using their principles against them. And it's only against them because they're the hypocritical ones. <laughs> they're the ones right. who don't consistently live by these convictions and what I mean by that is they want them for themselves, but they are not willing to grant the same latitude liberty to others. You need to think like they do. Tolerance is a one-way street, I've said many times, and that's exactly what you're facing. So I, I think it's fair in a very nice way to ask them these questions when they start giving you a hard time. Should I, should I be a hypocrite or not? Uh, should I live by my convictions? Do you think it's right for a person to live by their convictions. Do you think, what, what do you call a person who's a Christian who doesn't live consistently with their convictions? A hypocrite. Do you think I should be a hypocrite? Well, of course not. Well, right. uh, why are you giving me a hard time then when I'm trying to be authentic and living according to my convictions? How is that hurting you anyway? Your convictions aren't to beat up people you disagree with. That's the left, not yours. Right. You know, and probably not your friends either, but I'm just... So these are the kind of questions you could try to trade 
on what they say their ethic is, and then ask them to please live that out according with regards to you, and that might be easier for you. Make sense? Right. Did you it want does. to add anything to that? No, I, I, I mean, I'll add that I just appreciate you so much. I appreciate, um, you know, the STR staff for all that you guys put out. I watched uh, mm, I RPL. Oh, my gosh. I, I, uh, I share them with people, and so I just thank you for taking my call. Thank mm. you for doing this. You're so and welcome. You're so welcome. I, Remember, Jesus said, beware when all people speak well of you. All right? <laughs> yeah. So the circumstances that you described to me shows me that you are a light shining in the darkness. Thank you so much. All right, dear. Um, call back again. We'll chat again. Yes, absolutely. Thank okay. you, Mr. Coco. Okay, you're welcome. Bye, Laura. Bye-bye. That was a great call. Let's go to break, and we'll take our final call when we're done. This would be Amanda in Indiana. So oh, we got a bunch of North Midwest callers. So Amanda, stay where you are. We'll be back with you in a second. All right, final segment here on Stand to Reason, and our final caller is Amanda. Amanda, in Indiana, this has been like Midwest Day. <laughs> so it's good to have you. I, I love Midwest folk because I are one. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. Well, thank Chica you for taking my call. Oh, you're so welcome. I grew up in Chicago, just so you know. And went to school okay. in Michigan. That's and we got some. I'm about three hours away from Chicago. Yeah, that's right. And we've got some property in northern Wisconsin. So uh, anyway, I, I, my heart's in the Midwest to a great degree, even though I've been a half a century out here in California. So what's on your mind, Amanda? Hi. Um, well, I... Um, and married to an unbeliever, mm -hmm. and I I know it's God who changes hearts. Um, but I just wanted your opinion, or you know, your wisdom of kind of how to um, what's the word? Kind of um, ask good questions, or try and bring the conversations around to more um, you know, gospel things. He's more um, I would say apathistic, like he just doesn't care. He, wait, um, say that. Wait, say that phrase again. He's more apathetic. Ap apathistic, like apathistic, um, like he doesn't care about God. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, I've never heard the um, word before, but it's a clever word. You know, Shakespeare, um, I, Shakespeare made up a bunch of words too. So um, I, I didn't make that up, and I, I am so sorry. I don't know who the source for that term, huh. but I just heard it, and I was like, yes. Apathistic. <laughs> okay, I'm um, writing it but, down there. Add it to my vocabulary. Apathistic. <laughs> And, um, you know, it's kind of been, I guess, I've been listening in, and I guess it's a First Peter <laughs> uh -huh. kind of evening, because, you know, I'm that First Peter 3-1. Um, that's yeah. kind of my life. And I, I, I you know, in oh, interactions, yeah, I, I, I don't um, necessarily, like, I'm not pushy. Uh -huh. um, and I kind of cling to that, you know, section of Scripture, but also the Proverbs of, you know, not being a nagging wife, and it's better to be, you know. Yeah, that's right, um, tripping. You, you know, the, all, right. there's like, I forget, like, there's so many of those in there. I'm no, like, I get it, I get God it, God bless you. <laughs> and uh, I, you mentioned First Peter 3, 1 and following. It goes all the way down yes. to verse 6, and then it has one verse for the husbands. I don't read verse 1 through 6, because it ain't for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Per I'm glad you are. Okay, I read verse 7. That's for me. <laughs> Although, I'm just going to make an observation. Um, it's interesting that, it, and this isn't the only case where this is the case, but um, Amy probably is going to bug, get bugged because I made this comment, because it could be misunderstood, I guess. But uh, it's interesting that he spends six verses talking to women, to wives, and one verse talking to husbands. Anyway, there's a lot there in those six verses, and you're already familiar with that because you are facing the circumstance you're facing, and um, and it it speaks well of you that you are taking what you do know from the scripture and you're trying to apply it in a difficult circumstance in your life. That's the way I take what you said, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you want more than what you want from me, more than what Peter has given you, is. <laughs> No, I, I guess, um, you know, like when people don't care, and like I said, I know, I know God is the one that ultimately um, changes hearts, but 
I guess, um, you know, I've been reading your book, The Tactics and the, you know, like, sure. but I'm like, but he's not like, not engaging. <laughs> like, right, right. You know, uh, this and, is not a care. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, so I didn't just... know if there's like ways to like, um, that you would recommend, like maybe bringing a, a focus in or I don't know poking holes in some, like, logic or... Right, right. Um, it, well, it's an always a dangerous thing to do with a spouse, just so you know. Yes, and yeah, especially, sure. I think, for a wife with a husband, you know, because husbands have more fragile egos, uh, I think, when it comes to receiving instruction from their wives. Uh, I'm just making a generalization here. I also think that that apathy is one of the most difficult things to deal with. I mean, people ask me in general about that a lot. Well, what about people who are just apathetic and they don't care? Well, I wish I had, I wish I had an answer. I do think that the best way to navigate is to use questions in that situation, but I don't know that uh, it isn't that I have all of these questions lined up to 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 break the apathy barrier, because a person who's apathetic doesn't care. And right. then the question is, what will get them to care? Now, I'll tell you what usually happens. When somebody starts caring, it's when something really challenging happens in their lives. My dad was not a Christian uh, until he was 70 years old. All right, almost my age now. Oh, okay. And he was resistant for a long time. And when he went for open heart surgery, it really scared him. And that's when he got squared away with God. And he had successful surgery, but they found a spot in his lung that metastasized to his brain, and that's what took his life a year and a half later. Um, but I, I'm not saying this is the way God always works, but the, how do you get somebody's attention? who is apathetic. Right. You've got to, you know, you've got, you, you've got to make a big noise. All right. If people aren't paying attention, you make a big noise kind of thing. And so sometimes God makes a big noise in people's lives. And of course, y y you and I are familiar with a host of testimonies where this has been the case. Wandering around, doing my own thing, blah, 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 and then God got my attention, and it hurt. Um, and so, uh, I, that actually, in a certain sense, was part of my own testimony that something tragic happened in my life in a relationship while I was at Michigan State University that caused me to look more, it got my attention in terms of the ultimate issues in life that isn't what led me to Christ. I wasn't a foxhole Christian, although I, there's nothing wrong with that. But the in, in my case, it it forced me to look at my life and see how empty and vacuous my own views of the world were. And um, so subsequent to that, maybe a year or so later, a year and a half later, I became a Christian. But the uh, it, 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 something caught my attention. It, my world got shaken up. And, you know, you hate to pray for trouble, but uh, I've, <laughs> sometimes I've that's kind of, what it I've, takes. Uh, yeah, I've kind of done that, like, you know, whatever it takes kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I've asked for, like, strength to endure that because sure. that uh, would, you know, affect my, myself as well. So, Well, Amanda, you, you are a saint. I mean, I'm just, I'm very impressed with what you've told me so far. I, I wish that I could give you more. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with asking questions about about your husband's spiritual views, if he just says, you know, I don't care, I don't want to answer that kind of stuff. Uh, if you ask him, what do you think happens when you die? He said, I don't know, and I don't care. Well, what can you do? You can't go further than that. Why don't you care, maybe? But this is where it's going to be, you're, 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 you're kind of walking on thin ice in a marital right. relationship with a husband who's not interested in spiritual things. I'm curious, by the way, and I'm, I'm not trying to find fault at all. I'm just curious. Were you were you a Christian when you got married, or did you become a Christian after you got married? Well, it's kind of complicated, huh. but um, I think um, I've kind of been <laughs> trying to reflect on that, actually, because I'm um, pursuing membership at um, church, and they kind of want your testimony. Uh -huh. But um, So I would say... Um, uh, probably just in name only. 
and I had the label and um, right. just kind of more legalistic and um, and then kind of just at the time I was seeing what I wanted to see and kind of he was sure. showing me what I wanted to see and yeah. I was young. Um, sure. So and then um, when um, we had our first child, that's kind of when you know you talked about that moment when it's yeah. like I felt such a strong conviction of um, I I have to raise this child to know God. Do yeah. I know? Do I know? And right. It I think and that's kind of it was like from that moment like I just kind of. Everything changed. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, though, that that climactic event was the th- having a child was the thing that got your attention with the right. Lord? So it, it even worked in your life. There are a lot of people yeah. who had a circumstance like you did. They're kind of carrying along in a little religious activity and kind of part of a church, but there's no regeneration. There's no spiritual life there. Right. And then when something happens, you get. So, I mean, I would count you as having become a Christian after you were married. You know, uh, that would, from what you've told me, that's the way I'd, I'd count it. I, I think you should just, the, the best advice I could give to you, Amanda, is to keep on keeping on. Uh, you may have to spend a lot of time in First Peter chapter 3, the first six verses. I get it. I spent a lot of time in chapter 3, verse 7, down to verse 13, you know, or to verse 12, you know, because that's where I live a lot. I know almost the whole thing by heart because I have to keep reminding myself in circumstances that I'm facing that this is the way, the kind of man I need to be. And um, it's just, it's just a challenge. And this is why we need the Lord. So um, I'm glad you called it. I hope what I've offered, you know, was an encouragement, but I'm actually impressed with what you've told me. And it seems to me that if you're trying to follow what Peter says in the first part of that chapter, and you are showing appropriate deference and respect for your husband and keeping your vows, all of them, not just hanging together, but loving and having and holding and cherishing and all those other things that we said we'd do on that day, then you're doing what you can do. And the the rest is in God's hands, and only only God can do what only God can do. What you can do is just lay hold of the throne and just be persistent in prayer, in addition to being persistent in your virtuous living in your relationship with your husband, and then wait to see what God does. Uh, I've been in circumstances like this myself. You're just going to have to trust me. I can't go into detail where that's it. I, I'm, I'm going to be the virtuous man that God calls me to be, and trusting myself to, myself to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That's chapter 4, verse 19 of First Peter. I got to entrust myself to a faithful creator in doing what is right, and uh, and then let God take it from there, wherever it is he decides to take it. Make sense? Yes, yes. Amanda, it was a treat talking to you today. Well, it was so nice to talk to you, and I'm just so thankful for all that you guys do, and I, I really appreciate it. Well, you're so welcome. All the best to you. All right, thank you. Uh, bye-bye now. That was sweet and appropriate good ending for our good show. Greg Kokel here for Stand a Reason. Give him heaven, friends. Bye-bye.